Good morning. Psalm 103.2 says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. Welcome to Spring Hill Baptist Church, where we have gathered this morning to praise, to worship, and to remember the goodness of our God. If you are visiting with us, it is such a joy to have you with us during this time of worship. We look forward to having the opportunity to get to know you a little better. You can help us do that by taking the connection card in the pew pocket in front of you and filling that out and dropping it in the offering plate a little later in the service. This just lets us know that you are here today and which ministries at Spring Hill you'd like to have more information about. We are moving into a busy late spring and summer season, and there are a few things that we want to highlight this morning. This Wednesday night, our young musicians, children in third through sixth grade, will be singing in the dining hall at 6 o'clock p.m., and we invite you to be a part of that and to stay and join us for Bible study and dinner. Next Sunday afternoon, we have the Mother-Daughter GAT. This is one of our very favorite events of the year for moms and daughters. We ask that you would sign up by this Tuesday online so that we can be prepared for that. We're very excited and hope you can be a part. Our Spring Hill singers are busy preparing for their tour to Nashville that will take place in June, and they are still collecting shampoo and conditioner to share with the ministries that they will be visiting during their tour. They need any um, brand, any size for any hair type, and those can be dropped off in various locations around the church. And then finally, we are definitely looking forward to our vacation Bible school. We're headed into the jungle. I think that we just signed up the last volunteer we needed a few minutes ago, so super excited about that. But please be in prayer for that, and go ahead and sign your children up and be inviting friends and family to join us. Now, I mentioned in the early service, and I don't want to be remiss in not mentioning it here, but um, many, many, many years ago, our pastor made his appearance into the world on this day. So in a few minutes, when we stand up and greet, if you'd like to swing by and wish Brother Man a happy birthday, today's the day. So at this time, I'd like to invite you to stand and let's greet each other.
please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together this morning. I pray that you bless these tithes and offering to the furtherment of your kingdom. I also pray that you prepare our hearts and minds to receive your word through music and Ben's sermon. Be here with us, especially those who are sick and unable to be here with us, as you have heard in our prayer request. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you all so much. Please take your Bibles. Be finding the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 5. We're going to read in just a moment, verses 1 through 32. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1 through 32. And uh, I did not know Erica was going to tell you that it was my birthday in the 830 service and the 11 o'clock. Uh, but, but I was going to share 
the birthday card that my staff here at the church left to my desk, got it this morning, it's very kind, that staff shared birthday cards, that kind of thing. And I should probably not tell you this, but I will. And a different, um, years ago, I was a pretty big fan of the show called The Office. I'm not suggesting you go out and watch this show, but it's a different time in my life. And I got really familiar with different bits and parts of it. And there's a kind of a, kind of a, uh, the lead character is kind of a weirdo. Anyway, and, uh, and he, he's kind of a quirky guy. And the, the quote on The Office uh, is just so perfect. And I want to share it with you. He says uh, about, he's a manager of an office, and he says, you know, do I want my employees to really fear me or love me? He said, that's easy. Both. He says, I want people to be afraid of how much they love me, <laughs> which, <laughs> which just about summarizes what I hope happens among the staff and uh, at First Spring Hill Baptist Church. All right. Well, I want to show you something from Genesis 5. It is from the genealogy of the book of Genesis. We're working our way through the book of Genesis. And today we come to a passage that I bet for many of us, it, you know, if we're honest, it's the flyover part of the Bible. The genealogies, you know, this guy had this guy and he died. This guy had this guy and they died. We don't probably in our Bible reading plans really focus on the genealogies, but I think there's some good things here for us that we do well to pay attention to. And so in our trust of God's word and laying our minds before all of God's counsel, no matter what it is, easy to read and fun to understand or more difficult to understand and more difficult to read, I think we need to give our full attention to all of God's counsel. So it's with that in mind. I want you to look with me at the Genesis, excuse me, at the genealogy of Genesis 5. We're going to be looking at the lineage of Seth, all right? Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel and Cain ran off. And then we begin again in Genesis 5 with the lineage of Seth, all right? Would you stand with me out of reverence for the reading of God's word? The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. By his grace, this word be preached to you this morning as we listen to Genesis chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. The Holy Spirit writes, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, and he blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. Then the days of Adam, after he became the father of Seth, were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. And so all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Seth lived 105 years and became the father of Enosh. Then Seth lived 807 years after he became the father of Enosh, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Now Enosh lived 90 years and became the father of Kenan. And Enosh lived 815 years after he became the father of Kenan, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Now Kenan lived 70 years and became the father of Mahalalel. And then Kenan lived 840 years after he became the father of Mahalalel, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. Mahalalel lived 65 years and became the father of Jared. And Mahalalel lived 830 years after he became the father of Jared, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. Jared lived 162 years and became the father of Enoch. Jared lived 800 years after he became the father of Enoch, and he had other sons and daughters, and so all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah, and after he had other sons and daughters. And so all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Methuselah lived 187 years and became the father of Lamech. Methuselah lived 782 years after he became the father of Lamech, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. Lamech lived 182 years and became the father of a son. And now he called his son Noah, 
saying, this one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. And Lamech lived 595 years after he became the father of Noah. He had other sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. Now Noah was 500 years old, and Noah became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Well, if you agree with me that the reading of God's word in your hearing is a good thing, would you say amen? Amen. amen. You can be seated. Let's walk through this text now. And again, we're, we're dealing with the genealogy. And uh, there's going to be some work we've got to do to really, I think, get the best handle on what's happening here and what the Bible, I think, is trying to communicate to you. So we're going to walk through it and just bear with me. We're going to hit one section and I'm, I'm going to need you to get your Bibles open and point your finger in one verse and then point it at another one. And we're going to pull all this together. All right. First thing I want to point out to you is something I'm calling the new, the new beginning, the new beginning. Notice the language of chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Just let your eyes look there again. It sounds like the same language God used to open the Bible with, at least to begin talking about the creation of the world. God made man and woman in his likeness, made male and female. He blessed them and called them man on the day they were created. Doesn't it? It sounds like God's almost starting over. Even though we have four chapters already with the story of Cain and Abel, and then it ends there. And then chapter five, it's like God begins again. No discussion of Cain and Abel. It's not mentioned in the lineage of Adam. And he reiterates some of the, again, the same language, for example, of Genesis chapter one, verses 26 through 28. It's fascinating to me. And I think the omission of Cain in particular is on purpose. Um... There's no Abel or Cain even really for the rest of the Bible until you get to the book of Hebrews. But again, I think the intentional omission of Cain, who had also Adam and Eve as his father, is intending for us to pay attention to what's happening. I think it's fascinating. On the one hand, you have a son in Cain of chapter 4 who runs as far and as fast away from the Lord as possible. And on the other hand, you have this son named Seth, if you have chapter 4, notice verse 26, whose sons call on the name of the Lord. In fact, we hear about several notable sons in Seth's lineage, Enoch and Noah. I think this is an intentional contrast, and I think it's a warning. The warning is, you can have all the best background... I mean, what better parents could Adam and Eve, could, could, could you have other than Adam and Eve? Like, what better parents to tell you about the goodness of God and the, the dangers of sin and so on? They walked with God, right? They, knew, they were formed by the hand of God. So what better parents could Cain have had? And yet, he was not right with God. It's a warning to us. Uh, one preacher a long time ago, I heard him say it like this. He says, you know, just because something's found in a pan, it doesn't mean it's a biscuit. And for just because you're born in church, it doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you have the right lineage, right parents, right last name, it doesn't mean that God favors you more than anybody else. Cain had every possibility to do right and to live right. He had every reason to love and follow the Lord, but... He goes his own way. Uh, personally, you know, I've, as I've gotten older, I've understood this more and more that um, sometimes uh, people are, are nice to me because they know my parents and my parents were good people. And so they kind of extend to me a little bit of niceness and they kind of think I'm going to be a good person because of my parents. I didn't do anything. I, I just am riding on their coattails. Do you know what I mean? And that happens in all, to all of us in all walks of life, you know? If you know somebody at the mill, they can get you an interview. If you know somebody at that company, if they know your mama, your daddy, they might give you a chance. I'm telling you, it happens in jobs. It also happens all the way down to the Little League baseball field. You know, you're recruiting your team. Some of you coaches know what I'm talking about. You're picking your teams, and you remember, oh, that I mean, you, he's got the last name of a guy I played high school baseball with, and he was good, right? We're going to make sure we get that kid on our team. I've seen it happen. Your parents kind of give you an advantage sometimes if they have a good reputation. 
But you know, when you stand in front of the Lord, the Lord does not give bonus points for who your parents were. The Lord is unconcerned with what church you were attending, what waters you were baptized in. When we stand before the Lord, each of us must give an account for our own life, for our own actions of faith and repentance. Billy Graham used to say it like this. He said, God doesn't have any grandchildren. I think that's right. You don't come into the basis, you don't come into the kingdom on the basis of who you know or your family connections, your charm or your intelligence. You come through the blood of Christ by faith and repentance or you don't come at all. Seth and his generation called out on the name of the Lord and the Lord took note. Cain and his generation ran from the Lord and they turned their back on him. Notice first then the new beginning. We're going to begin with Seth. Notice then secondly the fulfillment of blessing. The fulfillment of blessing. Verse 2, God blesses them male and female. Now, uh, you're intended to hear back in Genesis 3 and in Genesis 1 and 2, when God blesses man and woman, the blessing implies be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In other words, they're blessed not just because of who they are, they're blessed to do something, right? To make more image bearers, sons and daughters on the earth. And what you read in the genealogy, I won't point out all the verses, but each individual has children and other sons and daughters and other sons and daughters and other sons and daughters. This is intended for you to read as a successful and joyful fulfillment of God's blessing upon Adam and Eve, the blessing upon male and female. The Bible does this throughout Genesis to Revelation. It sees children as gifts, as blessings, as, uh, as, as God's favor and kindness and love to the world in the reproduction of other little people, okay? The Bible always describes children as gifts, and that's always God's attitude towards children. And friends, that must be ours as well. We, we want to create a culture, a church culture and a family culture, where little feet and little squirmers in the pews and little wigglers, the smallest of our fellowship are welcomed and happy. Um, I have some great memories of kids doing things in church. Uh, One of my favorite ones was they were passing the offering plate and I guess I had a sermon or something about, I gave a little word about, you know, giving of the best that we have to the Lord or something like that. Six year old girl whispered kind of loudly as a plate was coming by, that preacher ain't getting any of my money. Just like that. <laughs> Isn't that good? Well, we have so many memories like that of children being blessings to our fellowship and blessings to our home. We want to be very careful about how we think about children. We want to be thinking biblically about children for what they are. Our children are blessings all the way through. We don't need conditions, we don't need ifs, we don't need our children are blessings when, we don't need our children are blessings if, we don't need our children are blessings because, our children are blessings, period. Full stop. They're not always easy. They're not always doing the right thing. They're not always simple. They're not always convenient. They're not always cheap. Can I get a witness, right? But they are good and gifts and welcomed. Um, Moms and dads, I just want to make sure we say this together. We want to be sure that that's the kind of heart that you are building in yourself. I sometimes, um, I regret to hear this occasionally, people describe their children as expensive inconveniences or obstacles to getting to do what we really wanted to do. things that interrupted our life, we wish we didn't, all that kind of thing. That's from hell. You know that, right? That's the doctrine of demons. Our children are blessings. In our homes, they are blessings. And certainly in the culture of our church and in this city, we want to rejoice when children come into our lives. 
I'm talking to my church, so let me just talk to you as a pastor and a little biography on me, okay? I did grow up going to church. My parents were believers, and they took us very often. And uh, looking back on my life, do you know one of the things that I think really helped my faith as a child was the sweetness of church folks. Do you know what I mean? You may have different memories of growing up in church. You may, um, you may have as a kid, you may experience different things. I have no memories of bad adults in my life as a child in church. I only have happy memories. Uh, there's always something to think. When I think about church as a kid, I remember my Sunday school teachers who were happy to see me once a week, who tried to make life a gift to me. I, tr- I remember those little finger cookies that would go over your finger. Do you know what I mean? The ones, y'all know what I'm talking about? Little uh, shortbread cookies. I remember the, there's always some guy in church who had like thousands of mints in his pockets. Do you know what I'm talking about? There's always the mint guy. I if that's you, God bless you. I'm not making fun of you. It was a gift to me as a kid. You always knew that guy. Sweet, nice. Uh, I only have good memories. And I'll tell you, it helped my faith to know that adults in church associated with the name of Christ were happy to see me. Um, I'm thankful to have this church where my children can grow up to see the kindness of adults who called on the name of the Lord and loved them. And that will make all the difference. That's the kind of culture we want to build. That's the kind of influence we want to have on the city of Mobile and in our nation that rather disdains children and sees them as inconveniences. I just spoke with someone recently who said they were being counseled not to have children for as long as possible. What? Fill your life with blessings, friends, if you're so able, and enjoy the blessed gift of our little ones. Well, it's a blessing, chapter 5. Number 3. Notice the fulfillment of the tragedy. There's blessedness in chapter 5. There's also tragedy. There's children coming into the world, amen and hallelujah, but there's also death. Again, this is all through the chapter. I won't read them all, but each person has children here and then dies. Children lives, dies. Children lives, dies. The and he dies at the end of each major kind of section is intended to elicit in you a notion of sadness. They lived a long time. Some of them lived a really long time, but they could not escape the curse of sin in Genesis chapter 3. God told Adam and Eve, as soon as you eat from this tree, you shall surely die. And here it is being lived out. They thought they were going to escape it. Somebody, Methuselah, that joker lived 969 years. He was doing good, but he couldn't avoid it, could he? The fulfillment of the tragedy here is since the fall, as Paul says, as sin came into the world through one man, death through sin, because all sin and death has reigned from the time of Adam through Moses into our current time. One, uh, uh, one Genesis commentator who I guess had been, um, <laughs> he needed a little uplifting here, but he was writing this language, I'll read it to you now. He says, a great plow furrows the earth and plows all of us under it in death, men, women, and children. Gracious. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you to Spring Hill Baptist, a place of hope and encouragement and uplifting. You know? <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Death reigns, and this cycle goes on and on. As Johnny Cash says, the man's going to come around. We just cleared April 15th. You probably know it. There's only one thing that's more certain than taxes. It's death. It's death. I have a little reminder of this. I don't usually do visual aids, but I couldn't help myself. This is Brother Ben. Can y'all see that? Did y'all see that choir? This, I keep Brother Ben on the desk of my office. This is not a real skull, by the way. This is a replica. Someone asked, is that your former chairman of deacons? I said, no, 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 no. This is, uh, this is Brother Ben. I keep him in my office, and I let him look at me. Well, there goes his jaw. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Let's put him back together. Sorry. He's got a little overbite now. All right. There we go. 
there. I keep him in my office to look at me like that when I'm studying the Bible. And it's sort of a, <laughs> that's kind of depressing, but it's really not. It's a reminder to me that I am a dying man preaching to dying men. It's a reminder to me of where we're all headed. It's a reminder to me that we'll all face death and I'm going to look like this one day if the Lord tarries. Even on my birthday, I look at him, right, to remind me. I'm here and I'm going to enjoy the life God gave me, but I'm headed for a different reality. To be absent from the body, for sure, to be present with the Lord, and this will be me at some point. Now, I told my children I want to wear really nice clothes when they lay me down, all right? So they're going to spend a lot of money to G me up. I'm going to look good when I go down, all right? But this is my reality. Now, um, this is my reality, but, you know, this is not what God has made us for. This is not what we're made for. And we get a little glimmer of this truth. As much as we get death in chapter 5, we hear about one named Enoch in the lineage of Seth. All right? Now, let's do a little work here. I'll put Brother Ben down there just for a little bit. And I need you to get your Bible out because we're going we're gonna to see a thrill of hope. That's the next point. You have the fulfillment of tragedy, but you also have the, th- the thrill of hope, all right? Now, I'm going to work through the genealogy, so you've got to hang with me. And if you've got your Bible, I need you to get it out and, and, and look also with me at chapter 4. The genealogy of chapter 5 is intended to contrast with the genealogy of chapter 4, which we see beginning in, ch- in chapter 4, verse 16. All right, now we're going to do some co- comparison and contrast here. We're going to look at the lineage of Cain in chapter 4, verse 16 and following, and we're going to look at the lineage of Seth. Now, all right, just for a second, I'm going to use a lot of names, and we're going to move back and forth, and you're going to have a tendency to zone out, all right? So I want you to do what you got to do. You're going to, uh, it's going to be helpful for you, and you're going to put this together in a nice way. So hang with me. Are you ready? Three differences I want to show you in the lineage of Cain and the lineage of Seth. First of all, notice that both lineages have different Enochs. Chapter 4, verse 17. Cain, who has wandered away from the presence of God, Cain conceives and gives birth to his child named Enoch. And Enoch builds a city. Or he builds a city for Enoch and they name it after Enoch. Now, that seems like a a passing detail, but it's really important because Cain, who departed from God's presence, was not supposed to settle. He builds a city, names it Enoch, whose name then becomes emblematic of Cain's rebellion. Enoch becomes a name synonymous with walking out of the presence of God. All right, go to chapter 5, verse 21. Seth has a different Enoch, and he lives, verse uh, verse 21 through 24, for a period of time, but look at verse 24. But Enoch doesn't walk away from the presence of God. Look at verse 24. Enoch walks with God. Cain has an Enoch represents walking away from the presence of the Lord. Seth has an Enoch who walks with the presence of the Lord. We'll come back to this in just a minute. Notice the second main difference. Stay in chapter 5. Seth has a Lamech. Chapter 5, verse 28. Seth has a Lamech who has a son named Noah who he believes is going to undo the curse of Genesis chapter 3. To bring blessing to the world. And this Lamech, notice this, interesting detail, verse 31. This Lamech in verse 31 lives how many, how many years? 777, three sevens. All right. Cain also has a Lamech. Do you remember Lamech? His story begins in chapter 4 and verse 19. Cain has a Lamech. And, and he is like the, the, uh, the rock star of Cain's lineage. If you remember from last week, he's a powerful guy. He's a kingmaker, you know? He's wealthy. He, uh, he rules, but he is prideful and rebellious. 
And notice what he says about himself in verse 24 of chapter 4. He said, if Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech is avenged what? Seventy-sevenfold. Three sevens. The Lamech of Cain's lineage, his sevens are associated with death and rebellion. The Lamech of Seth's lineage in chapter 5 is associated with promise and salvation. The third key difference, and then we'll move on, is just to bear in mind that um, the highlight in each lineage is the seventh generation. Seven is an important number in the Bible. Cain's seventh descendant is Lamech. We just talked about him. But Seth's seventh, uh, seventh descendant is Enoch, who walked with God. Now, I hope you've seen enough to see that what's happening in Genesis 5 is a very intentional contrast. There's the way of hell, the way of Lamech, the way of Cain, the way of rebellion. And there's the way of Enoch. There's the way of righteousness and blessing. You can go the way of Lamech, Genesis 4, or you can live in the wisdom of Enoch. The two genealogies are not just, you know, somebody retelling you the history. It is trying to make a point to you that there are two paths set before you. The way of unrighteousness or the way of righteousness. The way of cursing or the way of blessing. This is all through the Bible. These two paths, these two stories, pure and simple. You can either walk in the path of life or you can walk in the path of sinners. You can have healing or you can have destruction. You can have life or you can have death, joy, misery, redemption, or ruin. Your life, your way, your truth, or you can have the way, the truth, and the life of Christ. There's two paths. And I just want to listen to the genealogies. And I want to invite you to join the church on the path of life. Maybe you're here today and you're just on the wrong path. You're walking a path of immorality or anger, jealousy, and bitterness. You're wandering from God. And you know it's bringing chaos and disruption. Uh, It's bringing hardship into your life. And the Lord is inviting you, you see, to walk with him. The Lord is inviting the sinner whom he loves to come to him to help to let you help, to let him help you walk right again. And that's what's so amazing about Enoch. He walked with God, chapter 5, verse 24 says. Enoch walked not in the path of selfishness and immorality and pride. He walked with God. This is not an easy thing during Enoch's generation. We learn during a generation of Noah in chapter 6, verse 5, that the world was wicked. The Bible says that every intent of mankind's heart was evil continually. And yet Enoch walked with God. The text continues in verse 24. He walked with God and he was not, for God took him. We think this means, like Elijah, God spares Enoch from a natural death. The idea is because he walked with God so closely that God collected Enoch before he suffered a natural death. You need to hear the contrast in Genesis 5 again. And he died, and he died, and he died. Enosh, Kenan, Jared, Methuselah, Lamech, and he died, and he died, and he died. But one did not die. Verse 24. And why? Because he walked with God. One author puts it like this. He said, walking with God is the key to unlocking the chains of this curse. What does it mean to walk with God? What was Enoch doing? Marcus Dodds, an old commentator, says it like this. He says, to walk with God was to be in a persistent endeavor to hold all our life open to God's inspection and conformity to his will. It means a readiness to give up what we find causes misunderstanding between us and God. It means a feeling of loneliness 
if we have not satisfaction in our efforts at having fellowship with him. It means a cold and desolate feeling when we're conscious of doing something that would displease him. It means having an instinctive endeavoring to please the Lord and to be with him on thoroughly friendly terms, to know the Lord, not some things about God, but to know him intimately and to be known by him. That's what it means to walk with God. I mentioned to our Wednesday night uh, crowd, uh, you should, y'all should come on Wednesday nights, by the way. I hope you feel welcome to come. You should come. We have a blast. It's great. Food's good. And we just enjoy each other. It's a sweet time. I was mentioning to them Wednesday about some experiences I've had just this past week of talking to two different people about their walk with the Lord. Very different in how they described it. One person, when I said, tell me about your relationship with God, they described it in terms of duties. Well, you know, I go to this church, uh, you know, I was baptized at this day, uh, you know, and I try to do good in my life and I'm a pretty good person. And, you know, God's just always kind of been around. And then the other person, when I asked about their relationship with God, it was like, <laughs> it was like they had just, I don't know, stumbled into like, it, it was like they had just bit into the, the, the best thing that ever had in their life. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's the phenomenon I have when I drive into Auburn University. You know what I mean? Everything, excuse me, excuse me, y'all be quiet back there. Everything <laughs> just feels right. No, I'm kidding. Do you know what I mean? It, you, you, it's just something comes over you. And uh, I was talking about, I uh, asked them, tell me about your relationship with the Lord. And they did one of these. Then, I love the Lord Christ. He has been so gracious to me. Uh, he has been so kind. All that I have in my life is because of the goodness of God. And that was it. Now, both people may be fine believers. They may just be describing different experiences. But one seemed like they walked with the Lord, didn't they? One seemed like they knew some things about God. But the other seemed like they lived each day in the goodness of of the Lord. I was thinking about this this week, actually uh, getting ready for Sunday, you know, and the words of this hymn jumped into my mind. You probably remember this one. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus? Didn't that sound like my friend? <laughs> Thought about the Lord. <clears throat> Who can cheer the heart like Jesus? By his presence, all divine, true and tender, pure and precious. Oh, how blessed to call him mine. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of 10,000 in my blessed Lord I see. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. Now, you may like hymns more than somebody else. You may not care for all hymns. But whoever wrote that hymn walked with God. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. I wonder if you know the Lord like that. I wonder if you can say, I walk with God like that. At the mention of the name of Christ, something thrills my soul. I think that's what it means to walk with Jesus. Captivated by the Lord, enjoying the presence of God, pleased and trying to please the Lord in all our life. And I think that's what the author in verse 24 is inviting you into. Other folks died, they died, they died, but there is one whom the Lord honored, who walked with him. Enoch's not just a one-off. It's not just someone that one person can walk with God. No, no. The invitation to you, brother and sister, is to walk with the Lord as well. You may not escape death in this life as he did, but if you know the Lord like that, the promise is to you that you will, in the same way that Christ rose in defeat and victory of death, you will too. 
And in the same way that Christ enjoys uninterrupted fellowship with the Lord, you will too. To be absent from this body, one day I'll be, Lord willing, is to be present with the Lord. I'll just share, I'll just share a little bit more. I, I, I'm, on, I'm making great time this morning, all right? <laughs> Y'all know Will Wright. Will, who uh, went to be with the Lord. I'll share this detail with y'all. Um, I didn't share it with the 830 people because you know those people. You know how they are. <laughs> no, we were running out of time. Um, Will, who's loved by everybody who knew him. Um, I didn't get a chance to see him in the hospital as much as I would have liked, but I went by to see him one time. and um, He was very clear. And uh, if you don't know Will, you missed out. Will, you'll hear his name. Will was um, a wonderful Christian man, church brother and friend, went to be with the Lord recently. And Will very, we were laughing and talking, and uh, he very uh, deliberately looked at me in the eyes. And he said, I'm ready to go meet Jesus, Ben. I'm ready. Now, that's not a man who's suffering in pain, although he was uncomfortable. And that's not a man who's suffering in pain who says, I need to get out of here because I'm hurting too bad. That's a man who knows his time has come and he genuinely wants to see his Christ. There's a man who walks with God. I'm going to close now with the last point. Verse 29. Lamech has a man named Noah. He named him Noah. Why? Why? Because in the Hebrew... He says, this one will give us Nuah, the word for rest. I named him Noah because he will give us Nuah. He's going to give us rest. Rest from what? Rest from the curse. 29 describes the curse that God put upon the world because of the result of sin. And they were hoping that this one named Noah would give us Nuah. A relief, a reprieve from the burden of the curse of sin upon the world. They, they were anticipating someone to help them. Well, Noah, of course, delivers his family through the flood, but he does not deliver them from sin. And the same curse of Genesis 3 is found in after the 40 days of the water's recession. But Noah is a kind of Christ. He's not Christ, but he is a forerunner of what Jesus will do. Jesus did what Noah ultimately could not. He offers us a permanent solution to the crisis and consequences of sin. Jesus provides for us a final and full rest, a rest and a relief from your brokenness. I meet people who are dealing with sin and they are tired. People who are dealing with the consequences of their problems and they are looking for some relief from it. Jesus says, come. All who are weak and heavy laden, all you who are burdened, come. And I offer to you what? Not more work. Not some chores. I offer you rest. Relief. Unburden yourself. Take a rest from worry and anxiety. Come to me and receive a rest from your chaos. And I want to invite everyone here this morning to again, as we consecrate our life to the Lord, as believers, or perhaps you're here this morning and you're not a believer, and let's again together as the Lord's people commit to entering that rest, to throwing our life again in with Jesus for another week until we gather again, and to take him up on his promise to receive from his kindness and mercy and grace, his rest. Maybe you need forgiveness from sins this morning. Jesus stands ready, willing and eager to receive all broken, all the contrite, all the sinners, all those who need repentance. And in exchange for your worry and sin and shame and brokenness, he extends to you the promise of his newa, of his rest. Father, now help us to walk with you as Enoch did, as our dear brother Will did. 
so many who've gone before us and have lived so well did. And we ask, Lord, that you would fill us with gratitude for the work that you've done in Christ. And I ask that we would, gracious, I ask that we would walk in the rest that Jesus provides. Well, today's your day, and we surrender it to you. And ask you now to do with our life what you will. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn of invitation. Uh, You can take your hymnal and turn to number 588. We're going to sing, I know whom I have believed. And uh, if you are here this morning and you'd like to pray, take a moment then as we sing and you just pray. Brother, friend, sister, you pray right where you are. And you ask the Lord, what do you want me to do today? But you ask him that question with one answer in mind. If the Lord wants you to do something, will you promise me to tell him, yes, I'll do that. That's what I want to do, whatever you want me to do. That's the key to walking with the Lord. If you're here this morning and you just want someone to pray with you and over you, I would love the chance to do that. And so as we begin to sing, just come meet me down here right where you are, and I would love to pray with you and over you. We don't have to go into great detail about issues in your life. While we're singing, though, if you would like to do that, I would love to do that. Maybe you're not a Christian. You need to become one. Today is your day, and God is drawing you to himself. Well, same invitation. As these folks sing, just come meet me right here, and we'll just begin that conversation. It's not a high-pressure sales deal. I'm not going to try to convince you to do something you don't want to do, but I would love to continue the conversation with you to help you take your next step towards Christ. If you're not a church member and you're interested in pursuing that today, well, then we'd love to receive you as well. Same invitation. You come. We'll begin that conversation. We'd love to receive you in Jesus' name. Whatever the Lord's doing, however the Lord's leading, you come, respond as the Spirit of God moves. Let's sing together. Friends, if y'all would just have a seat just for a moment, I'm going to introduce you to a friend of mine. I'll take that one. Yeah, that's sister. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. I want you to, if you come stand with me, that'd be great. This is Miss Ann. Now, Ann, r- pronounce your last name for me. Mulwinnie. That's right. Thank you. Miss Ann Mulwinnie. And she's coming forward this morning to join our church fellowship. And uh, she's been attending with us for some time. And you've been coming on Wednesday nights as well been involved in the life of the church and she's coming forward. She is a believer and wants to unite with us in church membership and we're super excited to have you come forward, sister. Thank you for coming. Um, and actually, we were at our house, uh, this is a couple of weeks ago, I think now, a couple Sundays, and I heard a, a lot of racket going on next door. Kids laughing, everybody have a good time. And out walked Ann right next door. And so, I don't know what y'all were doing, but it was a great time. And uh, so next time I'm going to get in on that, I think. Next. I can 
<laughs> okay, they're playing baseball. She said. <laughs> anyway, Anne, we're super delighted you're here. Thank you again for coming. And I've gotten to know Anne. I've heard her testimony. This is a sister who wants to know the Lord well and serve the Lord well. And it's been just a delight to get to know. So thrilled to have you. And we like to say at these kind of moments, this is a commitment. It's a covenant for us, from, from us to you. And I know we've talked about this of yourself and your life to us as well. So we want to help watch over you and help you grow in your relationship with the Lord. And I know that as you grow with us and serve, and uh, you'll do the same. And so we're excited to have you. And thank you for coming forward this morning and standing in front of these folks. If you have a chance after the service is over, I know she'd love to meet you. And, uh, and if you're willing to stay here just for, a fo- just for a minute, some folks would love to come speak to you and say hello. And that'd be great. Yeah. If you agree with me that we should welcome Anne into our fellowship, would you sign by saying amen? Amen. Thank you so much. Sister, we're delighted to have you. You can have a seat here just for a moment. What I want to say to you also as the afternoon goes on that uh, I'm here and if you don't have anywhere to be, you want to talk more about these or any other things, I'd love to do that. An invitation we like to say is never over. And so if there's anything on your heart and mind you'd like to talk about, if you're a guest visiting and you'd like to meet me again, I'd love to see you as well. If you have time, stick around. I would love to do that. I'll be right here and would enjoy talking with you. All right. Let me pray for you and then we'll be dismissed. Father, I pray for my friends, my brothers and sisters. These are people that were trying to navigate the challenges of of living for you in this world. I pray that you'd bless them, that they would find favor in your sight, that they would grow to love and know you more and more each day, and that our church would be a place for holiness, righteousness, and power, and that we teach our little ones to know and love the gospel, to send them out into the culture as missionaries, as ambassadors of Christ. And as we go to the workplace and to our neighbors and wherever we, you know, wherever we find ourselves, that we would represent the gospel of Christ and be a sweet aroma to those who are seeking salvation from you. We love you. We thank you for today. And we ask we'd enjoy a day of rest in our Lord Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Mm-hmm.